Right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, see you from the uh, town hall clock, as they say. Uh, it's now six o'clock. My name's Councillor John White, and I'm the chairman this evening, and on my left I have the vice chairman, Councillor Jeff Bray. The other councillors sitting either side of the table are, in fact, um, the members of the, that will decide on the applications this evening. Uh, on my immediate left and right, I have the TDC officers, including head of planning, the planning manager, and the council's senior solicitor. This is a formal committee, and it's very important that councillors can hear and debate all of the presentations. So uh, I do ask that you do remain quiet and don't interrupt the speakers. The uh, order tonight of the business will be uh, officer's presentation and for the first item we shall have um, public speaking. I said for the first item, when we get to the second item I'll make a statement um, and then we shall, uh, after the public speaking, we'll have any further comment from the officer and then the committee will ask questions, debate and finally vote on the application. Uh, this evening we only have two items in front of us, so uh, that being the case, I don't need to give the notice about carrying on tomorrow, I hope. I should finally add that this meeting is recorded by the Council and will be available on the Council website in approximately 10 days' time. <coughs> so, we turn to agenda items. Item one, apologies, and any substitutions? Thank you, Chairman. Apologies for absence have been submitted on behalf of Councillor Placey, and there is no substitute for her. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, minutes of the last meeting, and... The solicitor's trying to indicate that she'd like to add something to that before I ask if they're a correct record. Thank you, Chairman. Um, one of the councillors um, in the audience has pointed out there is actually an error on the minutes on page five of your agenda. It's the third paragraph from the bottom, which says Councillor Scott, a local ward member, spoke against the application. He actually spoke in favour um, of that application. Right. Thank you very much for that correction. Uh, I don't think anybody else had spotted it, so it's uh, pleased we can put that right. Now, nobody else had indicated there were any errors or omissions. So, subject to that being altered. Uh, Councillor Scott, the local ward member, spoke in favour of the application. Can I, having corrected that, can I sign those as a true and correct record, please? Yes, I guess. And I shall initial that. Good. Um, any other points? If not, can I sign those as a true and correct record, please? Mm. I can. Yep. It's... Thank you very much. Uh, declarations of interest. Are there any disclosable pecuniary interests or any personal interests and the nature of it? No one indicated. No, there are none. I have not received any item for questions. So we move on that, which takes us straight to agenda item five, which is a planning application number 1900738. This is a full application, and it is land at the rear of one and two, the paddocks, Windmill Road, Bradfield. Um, call on Mr. Faulkner, I think, for this one. Thank you, Chairman. 
As stated, the application before us tonight is an application for five detached bungalows on land to the rear of one to two the paddocks, Windmill Hill Road in Bradfield. Uh, the plan before you is the application site, uh, which obviously will take access between two existing dwellings on Windmill Road with a private drive leading into the scheme. Um, in terms of this application plan before you, uh, the application site as submitted was actually larger as first submitted and it did include this triangle of land to the rear of the site. Um, and during the life of the application that has actually been reduced. Um, it was a site of 0.55 of a hectare and in terms of national planning policy framework guidance, um, that would actually constitute a site which is major development, which is a site of uh, either more than 10 dwellings or a site of 0.5 hectares in the area. And in terms of national guidance, that does then uh, trigger the need for affordable housing on sites. Um, in terms of the application site, well, we'll go back to that later, but I just wanted to make that point in terms of the boundaries of the site. Um, in terms, this is a rather old image, so the development to the south of the site was a scheme that was built out a while back. It's a scheme for 10 dwellings, mm -hmm. and so that's that area there to the south of the site. And on this piece of land here, which is to the front of Windmill Road, uh, there was a scheme that was also approved for two detached dwellings. And the site before, as I said, is this land here, uh, marked in red. So quite sporadic development to the north and to the, the, the west of the site. Obviously, a ribbon form of development that actually runs along Windmill Road, but obviously there is a principle of backland form of development immediate to the, the south of the site. This plan is from the adopted local plan. Um, helpfully there, it's just actually arrowed where the site is. So as of the adopted plan, it does sit outside of the uh, settlement area for Bradfield. Uh, more recently, this is the emerging uh, plan that's in the emerging local plan. Um, the site does still sit outside of the, de the development framework area, but as you can see, the area that has now been developed to the south of the site has now been included, so it just sits immediately adjoining to the settlement area. Um, this is a plan looking into the site uh, from Windmill Road, looking down into the actual site. Uh, you can see, obviously, the uh, bungalow development that's been developed immediately to the uh, south of the site uh, there, and obviously an existing dwelling to the other side of the access. This is a site looking back towards Windmill Road, so you can see the two new uh, how, uh, bungalows that have been built along Windmill Road to the front there. Uh, obviously quite a substantial uh, tree belt to the north of the site. This is a plan looking southwards. Uh, that's towards the uh, development of 10 dwellings on what is actually now called, I believe, Margaret's uh, Place uh, to, the, to the south of the site. Obviously that's well advanced in terms of its development. Uh, another more long distance view of that same scheme. And this is the application plan, as I said. It shows a, a new uh, hard surface access road off of Windmill Road leading into the site. And then we have a dispersed uh, element of uh, bungalow development, five dwellings uh, within the, the application site. Uh, in terms of amenity standards, it does fully comply with council standards in terms of garden sizes and likewise in terms of parking provision. Uh, these are just uh, elevations of the bungalows, uh, obviously showing the internal layout, obviously uh, re relatively standard layout in terms of uh, three bedroom properties with kitchens, living space and bathrooms, and below that obviously showing the, the detached garage elements. Uh, obviously the various uh, plots, slightly different in configuration. Again. That one shows more of an integral garage element. Um, and this shows the development to the south of the site. As I said, uh, obviously approved a while back and it's uh, well advanced in terms of what's actually been built on, on the ground. Um, 
as I said, the recommendation um, in terms of um, other elements of this scheme, um, there was a requirement for habitat in terms of habitat regulations. Uh, an assessment was carried out, and uh, you know, actual undertaking has been provided to actually accommodate the uh, the the sums required. And likewise, with open space, there is a deficiency of open space within the settlement. And again, that is met through the, the application through the same unilateral undertaking. Uh, the recommendation before members tonight is for approval. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. So uh, I've got a member of the public speaking in favour of the application, Mr. Bill Marshall. If you're there, sir. Oh, good. Good well, evening. As you appreciate, you get three minutes. OK. Thank you very much. <coughs> good evening, members. This application should be supported and approved by members of the committee, which has, which the application has also been recommended for approval by the officers. The Tendering District Council adopted local plan has limited weight and the emerging local plan has very limited weight. Therefore, the National Planning Policy Framework 19 should be considered and as TDC are unable to demonstrate a five-year housing supply figure, presumption in favour of the sustainable development should be made without delay. This means that land allocated outside or located outside a recognised settlement boundary should not be necessarily be refused and all benefits of the scheme should be considered when determining the application and decided upon its merits. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, and now the uh, Parish Council of Bradfield, uh, Councillor Corinne Wynne. If you'll push the microphone down and keep that on, and you've got three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman, committee and officers, Bradfield Parish Council are requesting that you reject this application for the following reasons. This proposal is backland development and is outside the SDB. In 2013, the SDB was tightened up. The reason for this change, and I quote from the 2013 policies change map, to address concerns from local residents about the inclusion of the large area of open land to the rear of properties in Straight Road and Windmill Road, which could result in development over what is considered fair and proportionate for Bradfield. The SDB is slowly being expanded to allow the creation of cul-de-sacs that are predominantly bungalow-lined, changing the nature of a rural, rural village characterised by its ribbon development with street-facing houses of all styles with long gardens into a suburb of what is fast becoming the conurbation of Manningtree, Lawford and Mistley. There is no identified local need for this additional development in the parish. In the past five years, there have been 51 new builds, 27 of which are bungalows. The type of dwelling proposed does not meet the affordable homes requirement of the parish. This development, together with other small developments in the parish, have contributed nothing in terms of Section 106 provision. Moving on to the inadequate and restrictive road access with its potential problems for emergency access, the parish council are concerned about the poor highways sight lines. The access road enters onto Windmill Road on a slight bend at its narrowest point. There are four buses per hour down the road, plus the delivery vans and cars that cut through from Missley and Manningtree. All the roads through Bradfield are very narrow and with parked cars become single lane. At all times of the year, there are tractors and other large agricultural traffic vying with buses, delivery vans and trucks to get past each other. When two large vehicles meet, one or both have to pull onto driveways or mount pavements to pass. Where are the visitors of this development expected to park? 5.4 on the planning statement states that the solicitors acting for the developers of the neighbouring site to the paddocks have confirmed that the intervening fence will be reduced in height. The owners of number two, the paddocks, confirm that the fence in question belongs to them and they have no intention of reducing its height. These same owners have been having sleepless nights worrying about their loss of privacy and the disturbance that they will suffer with an access road running the entire length of their property. 
carrying all the associated traffic of residents, cars, posts, delivery vehicles, visitors and dust carts. This invasion of privacy will also affect the occupants of Kingswood on the opposite side of Windmill Road to the Access Road. This will be caused by car drivers looking straight ahead and headlights shining into a home that is entirely glass fronted. The dust cart raises another issue. The access road will surely be too narrow and the turning head difficult for the lorry to manoeuvre, meaning that all five bins will have to be dragged to Windmill Road. If this is the case, then where will the five wheelie bins and five lots of recycling and food caddies be left for collection? The final point is that there is a restrictive covenant from 1972 on the land on which one and two the paddocks and this proposed development stand that states that no more than two houses will be erected on the site. This covenant is blatantly being ignored by the developer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now the ward member, Councillor Fairley. Thank you, Mr Chairman and members. I've called this application in. As for Bradfield, this backland development is a step too far and will be harmful to the village, the countryside and the neighbours' privacy. Windmill Road is narrow and access is unsafe. I would ask you to refuse the application on the following grounds. As stated in 1.2, the site lays outside of village boundary and despite a recent appeal decision which determined the neighbouring site is socially acceptable together with the very small economic benefits gained from five dwellings, the MPPF economic objective clearly refers to supporting building only on the right type of land. For this particular site, the land is subject to a legal covenant stipulating a maximum of two dwellings and although this is a civil issue, are we really satisfied that land subject to such a covenant could be considered as the right type of land? The social objective aims to support strong, vibrant and health, healthy communities by ensuring that a sufficient number and a range of homes can be provided to meet the needs of present and future generations. Our district council, council's housing need figures show that the main deficit lays within one bedroom accommodation with 94 households on the waiting list, with two bedroom accommodation, 69 households on the waiting list. Another five three bedroom bungalows are actually the last thing that Bradfield needs. And socially, there is no community benefit to be gained through this application as it falls again below the trigger number of dwellings. For the environmental objective, which clearly states buildings should contribute to protecting and enhancing our natural, built and historic environment, this application on land subject to a historical covenant designed to protect it is surely a direct contradiction. This approach to approval isn't what I want for our district, where the only benefit will be to the developer, and I'm sure actually it's not what the MPPF intends either. The application is backland development against LPA to merging local plan policy. It's awkward to access, together with the access being unsafe. It suggests a single lane private driveway running directly adjacent to and alongside the neighbouring property, despite our policy clearly stating long or narrow driveways will not be permitted. Undue disturbance and loss of privacy to the neighbouring residents will be caused with this development, especially due to the headlights forever shining through the windows in a straight line into the bungalow directly opposite. This will constitute harm to their private amenities. A few weeks ago, Essex County Councillor Carlo Gugliami arranged a site visit between an ECC highway officer and the chairman of Bradfield Parish Council. During the meeting, he stated that unless the telegraph pole is either recited or removed, the proposal could not be approved and there is no way to access the site. See page 23, 8.3, Highways Informatives. Are you committee members satisfied that this requirement is or will be met? They also discussed safe visibility, which is covered in the conditions bullet point 8.2.3, which is page 21 of your report, which states, prior to the occupation of the development, a 1.5 by 1.5 metre pedestrian visibility splay, as measured from and along the highway boundary, shall be provided on both sides of the vehicular access. Such visibility splays shall always be retained free of obstruction above 900 millimetres. These visibility splays must not form part of the vehicular surface of the access. Reason, to provide adequate intervisibility between the users of the access and pedestrians in the adjoining public highway in the interests of highway safety. Are you satisfied that this will be met? I am sure at the site visit earlier this morning it was pointed out to you that the height of the fence on the left looking down the drive was higher than 900 millimetres. Condition 8.2.6, page 22 of your report, states that prior to the occupation of any proposed dwellings, the proposed private drive shall be constructed to a width of 5.3 metres for at least the first six metres back from the footway and provided with an appropriate drop curb crossing of the footway. Reason, to ensure that vehicles can enter and leave the highway in a controlled manner and to ensure that opposing vehicles can pass clear of the limits of the highway in the interests of highway safety. 
Are you satisfied that this width can be achieved? Would it not be better to see if the driveway can be built to the required width? And if it can't, I would suggest to you that this would give rise to a development which would not be compliant. A further highway informative, 8.3, on page 23 of the report, suggests a passing place for a minimum dimension of 2 metres by 7.5 metres to ensure medium to large vehicles can pass clear of the limits of the highway. Are you satisfied this will be met? Although several conditions will be imposed on the applicant if this application is improved, despite best intentions, the reality in enforcing them is a matter of doubt, taking into account previous history where breaches have either, been take, have either taken years to resolve or have not been resolved at all. Please refuse this application on the grounds I've put forward. Bradfield has had enough expensive bungalows built. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, and now the... Uh Agent or applicant, Mr. Legree, please. Thank you, Chairman. No, members, quite a few points were raised uh, in those uh, two uh, submissions. Uh, first of all, there is no covenant on the land. The 1972 covenant that's been uh, mentioned has been removed, so that doesn't exist. There is, however, a covenant in respect to the fence um, to the right-hand side. You can leave the uh, entrance, and that is a matter that the developer of that uh, site is pursuing. The owners of that property have constructed that fence in clear breach of a covenant that was imposed on their sale. Um, backland development, as you've uh, no doubt aware, um, is acceptable providing it meets certain criteria. And uh, there's been a considerable number of developments that have proved uh, throughout the district in uh, recent years that have met those criteria. This scheme is no different to that. Um, mention was made this morning about the width of the driveway. Perhaps I can just um, mention what the Essex Design Guide says about private driveways. A shared private drive off a county road and road types one to three must be 4.1 metres wide for the first six metres from the highway, tapering over six metres down to 2.4 metres. So a driveway only has to be 4.1 metres wide to be acceptable, reduced down to 2.4. This driveway is 5.3 over its entire length. It therefore far exceeds the standards set by the County Council and set out in the design guide. The suggestion about a passing bay can easily be met because 2.4 metres for the driveway plus a 2 metre wide um, passing bay is 4.4 metres. Still 0.9 metres um, with spare um, in, in terms of that width. So those criteria can easily be met. I'm sure members have been advised on many occasions uh, the circumstances should they wish to uh, oppose the views of the county highways uh, officers um, in terms of the technical specifications um, of any form of development such as this. In terms of the relationship to neighbouring properties, the uh, um, property to the north has no objections to the scheme. The property to the south of the access has a double garage, not two bungalows, as mentioned by Mr Faulkner in that photograph. It's actually a garage. It's a very large double garage. There's no loss of privacy, as been mentioned, because these are single-storey buildings and they're significantly um, more than 20 metres away from the, any, uh, any of the neighbours. So uh, there cannot be any loss of privacy involved there. Um, it was mentioned about land in the corner um, and the, uh, the change in the shape and nature of the site. That was actually advised by the council's planning officer that that land should be deleted. We have followed the advice of the council's own officer in that respect. The issue about um, lights from cars e exiting from the site and the property opposite, well, if I can just perhaps... Um, demonstrate that Margaret Place, that's immediately to the south, which is allowed on appeal, um, that uh, driveway is immediately opposite a dwelling there, and the inspector raised no particular concerns uh, about that. Uh, there was no public benefit, was mentioned um, by two of the speakers. Uh, there is a legal agreement that's been signed and sealed, executed with your authority, um, to ensure that at least £12,000 um, is given for place-based purposes for the parish council. I'm not aware of what else has been secured for other developments, but this scheme meets the criteria set out in your local plan. 
In terms of car parking, each property has four car parking spaces uh, that far in excess of your normal standards, in fact, uh, uh, double your normal standards, so plenty of space for people, visitors and so on to, to park there. Um, and, and I'll just say to the final comment about the settlement boundary. I don't need to remind members too much that there is a shortage of housing land in this district. That's a situation that has occurred uh, through the process of the local plan. That is a situation that you're facing on both this and many other sites. And I'm sure you've been advised very, very clearly uh, and through appeals uh, decisions that um, just because a site is outside the settlement boundary is not a reason for refusal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I will turn now to see whether Mr Faulkner has got any points that he wishes to bring up at this stage. Chairman, um, the only part I would come back was with regard to Councillor Fairley's comments. Um, with regard to the legal covenant, I, I would agree. Um, I don't think that is a reason to actually not determine the application tonight. Um, it is a civil issue, uh, even if the scheme is, is obviously approved, there is obviously an ability if there is a, a covenant on it. Uh, it's suggested obviously by the applicant's mm -hmm. agent that has been lifted anyway. Uh, I can't confirm that either way, but even if it hasn't, clearly that doesn't mean this application can't be determined tonight. Um, in terms of the other legal issue that was raised, uh, in terms of uh, the ability to actually create the uh, 1.5 by 1.5 uh, visibility displays on the access to the site, again, uh, within the recommendation, there is a proposed condition for that display, and no dwellings can be occupied to, until that is delivered. Um, and clearly, if there is a legal dispute between the parties, well, clearly that would have to be resolved before that that could actually proceed to have been uh, an occupied scheme. So that will have to be resolved as part of this, uh, uh, if it is minded to approve this scheme tonight. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, councillors. We're now into the questions to the officer, if you have any. And I'm going to start one fundamental one to him myself. I, I'm sure he said, uh, when we're talking about the recognised settlement development, both on the notes and indeed the update sheet today, it says that um, the application site falls outside in both the adopted and the emerging local plan. Um, my understanding of what you said, and perhaps I heard it wrong, uh, is that it is now in the emerging local plan. Is that correct? No, sorry if that was uh, misunderstood. Oh, no, no, that's uh, fair enough both in terms that this is the adopted local plan and clearly the site shown by the arrow is obviously outside of the settlement area and in terms of the plan that is obviously at the uh, amended or oh sorry the uh, emerging stage uh, it sits actually immediately adjacent to obviously the land to the south which is now being developed or is nearly complete has been obviously included, obviously as a site that has so been developed. The site we're talking about tonight is not in either. It place. lies immediately Thank adjoining Thank you very to much. Now, councillors, it's over to you now. Yes, Councillor Goldthorpe. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, looking at the, uh, the officer's report, we see that in um, 6.4, they make reference um, by way of justification of, of, of approval to, um, oh, sorry, not for 6.4, 6.5. Um, they talk about a planning uh, application that was uh, refused for one house, um, which was subsequently granted on appeal. Uh, this is paragraph 6.5, 6.6. 6. Um, this is a single dwelling um, on the other side of Windmill Road. Um, I think there's a more relevant um, appeal um, for uh, a backline development of four houses um, which was um, an application uh, of straight road. Um, I did ask if uh, the officer could uh, get up a drawing. I don't know if he, uh, if he possibly can. Uh, if not, it's not a problem. I have unfortunately not been able to... Okay. Um, could you uh, get up the site plan, uh, please? So uh, the application I, I, I'm referring to um, is from 2016. Um, I think the circumstances are quite similar. Um, it was for four houses rather than five. Um, 
Oh, sorry, could you get the, the actual site plan, the one that shows um, the, the N symbol uh, denoting north? I think it was the one after the aerial plan. Um, it'll go on. It's in there somewhere. No. You definitely had one that had a... a well, okay, it, it doesn't matter. Go back to the aerial plan, please, then. Um, if you look to the left of, of tonight's site, um, the very top left of the site is a, is a building. Um, uh, go a little to the right, please. Um, no, no, no. Uh, the, the, the top left of the red, um, the top left of the red, there's a little building there. And then if you go up to um, the next uh, plot, just, just, a, just a little bit above. Right, this is um, a property on Straight Road who had applied uh, to build four houses um, in that area. Um, accessed between two houses <coughs> by a very long, uh, narrow drive. 5.5 um, metres init initially for the first six metres, <coughs> narrowing to 3.7, um, widening to 4.8, um, but, but uh, culminating with four houses. Um, the planning inspector um, dismissed this appeal, and I think that's why it's relevant um, for tonight. The main reasons being um, adopted policy HG13. Um, I'm going to quote a little bit from, the, uh, from that appeal because I think it is, uh, there's a lot of parallels. Um, so, um, and uh, the inspector says, both Straight Road and mill, Windmill Road are characterised by long back gardens behind the properties on both roads. The proposal would represent a very different alignment. Um, I think that still applies to some extent. Um, we've heard that a precedent has been set with these backland um, approvals, but I would argue that they did harm, and if we use that as a precedent, then we're just going to carry on do, doing, doing more harm. Um, the uh, inspector goes on to say, um, I have no reason to believe that individual properties could not be provided to a design that is satisfactory, but I agree with the council that in the context of a wider area, which is straight road on one side, windmill road on the other side, and, and even the wider area. I have no reason to believe, oh sorry, um, I agree with the council, in the context of a wider area, the outcome would be a development with an uncomfortable relationship to its surroundings. I think, I think that still applies. Um, we have access between, unfortunately we can't see it, but narrow access between two existing properties. Um, I can therefore understand, this is the inspector again, I can therefore understand the council's concerns. Um, well, okay, this is a slightly different point. If, if, if it were to go forward, um, it could be used to justify substantial further development in this part of Bradfield. And again, I think that, that still applies. Quoting again, I acknowledge that in general terms, Bradfield may be able to accept some degree of change, of, of course. However, I also, I also conclude that on balance, the impact of a development on the appeal site would result in sufficient material harm to the character and appearance of the village as to conflict with policy HG13 and therefore weigh substantially against it. And I think one of the um, arguments the parish councils made over the years with several applications here is the effect on the, on the character of, of the village. Um, the inspector talked about the, um, the access to the site. Um, there remains a further issue of the impact of the access drive on the living conditions of the two existing dwellings. Saved policy QL11 of the adopted local plan will permit development, will only permit development, where it would not have a materially damaging impact on the privacy and other amenities of the occupants of nearby properties. And I think we've heard that um, we've got this house facing, and we've also got the two adjoining properties. And I'm not sure what the... Um, property on the left when viewed from Windmill Road is numbered, but obviously this access drive runs the entire length of their, of their property. Um, the inspector says, whilst I accept, this is four houses we're talking about here in, in, in this refusal, whilst I accept there would not be a continuous stream of traffic accessing the proposed four houses, and tonight we have five, I consider that the number of vehicle movements would lead to a significant deterioration in the quality of life in the two existing back gardens. Tonight we've got five houses and we've just heard 20 parking spaces. So a 20% uplift in traffic um, here. Um, the inspector says, I'm concerned that the effects of noise and car lights 
would result in unacceptable disturbance, especially in the hours of darkness. So it's stating the obvious. But we have this additional third property directly facing the, um, the access. The planning balance, just, um, this is the last thing I'm going to quote from here. The planning balance. The principal arguments in favour of the proposed development are that it would provide four additional properties in a district where there is currently no five-year supply of deliverable housing sites and in a location that is reasonably sustainable. Um, we're in a very similar situation. We can't demonstrate um, five-year supply. I agree with the inspector. This is a reasonably um, sustainable site. Um, however, it would do so in a manner that would significantly breach the existing character of a settlement with an access that would result in what I would consider to be an unacceptable impact on the living conditions of the current and future occupants of two existing properties. On balance, I therefore conclude that the proposed development would result in a significant and demonstrable adverse impact sufficient to outweigh those benefits. I think that's very, very much what we have tonight, um, except we have five houses, more traffic movements, um, and a third house that would be quite badly impacted. So um, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other speakers? Yes, Councillor Harris. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> okay, I mean, following uh, the visit today, uh, I had uh, a number of concerns um, and, you know, taking some of the points that Councillor Cawthorn uh, has just raised as well. Um, when, when I look at any site that I go to, I, I tend to uh, look at the possible impact on, on neighbours. And, you know, listening to... Uh, the, the, uh, the member from the parish council and the ward councillor, uh, clearly they've got uh, concerns as well. Um, what struck me in particular uh, was the, the effect that it would have on the, uh, the house opposite, which I believe is called uh, Kingswood. And, you know, I, I know that the, the applicant mentioned another uh, development where, you know, it, it went ahead, but you know, I don't know the condition of that house and what it was and the exact positioning. But you know, I looked very, very carefully at the position of, of the road to the house opposite, and you know, it, it was glass fronted. And you know, I would just imagine myself sitting in there in my living room or in my bedroom um, at you know, particularly this time of year, from four o'clock, you're going to need your headlights, and you're going to be driving out there, and those headlights are going to be shining directly into uh, that property um, every time they go in and out. We've already um, heard that it's got 20 parking spaces, plus, uh, you know, we all buy from Amazon there and, uh, uh, and other companies, so you've got plenty of delivery vans going in and out, etc. That happens, but that, you know, that's life. But it's the impact that it would have on that property. So if I lived there, I'd be pretty peed off if all of a sudden I've got all these, these lights bearing down on me, um, particularly with the new style headlights that they are, which are extremely bright and would be very, very upsetting for the individual there. So there, there's, there's one concern. Um, I would like the officer to confirm as well the, um, the, the legal position with regards to the fence from the uh, I think the paddocks, I think it was, uh, the, the property, as you look at the site, uh, immediately to the left where the, uh, the fencing has got to come down. I know that the, uh, the applicant said, uh, or the agent for the applicant said today, uh, whilst on site, that that fencing was to be removed. Um, now, clearly the, the applicant, or sorry, the resident that lives there has no, got nothing to do with the, uh, the, the, the proposed uh, development. Um, so what we said, if that doesn't get removed, if, if that isn't removed, then this, this can't go ahead. Is that what we're saying? Um, and I think you said in, in, in your point there that no property can be occupied, um, but does that mean they can still be built? Um, so <laughs> um, there's, there's a question there for you. Um, and other issues. Right. Um, the, the road itself, uh, it is a very windmill uh, windmill Lane, Windmill Road, um, the, the main road along, alongside uh, Windmill Road. There it is. Um, it is a very narrow road. We were sat on our, our minibus, and as we were pulling away, uh, I don't know if I know that that's, uh, Councillor Codlin uh, that, uh, witnessed it as well, but there was, there was a bus, one of these buses that, that turn up sort of four times an hour, came in the opposite direction, and it literally had to drive about six feet into somebody's garden 
so that it could it could pass by. So just to give you an idea of the, the, that it is a concerning road, it is very narrow, um, and more traffic will, will only cause more issues. And I think it would be an issue pulling out of, of that site. Uh, the telegraph pole is an obvious one. Uh, telegraph pole doesn't get removed, then it simply can't go ahead, unless everybody's going to drive a motorbike down there. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that this would not, it, it would be a condition if this was to be uh, approved, that the telegraph pole would be removed uh, prior to the commencement of, of this uh, development. Uh, I'm going to put my health and safety hat on again. Um, I'm, I do quite a bit of this uh, in my business. Um, that uh, the, the actual drive runner, and I hear the, the applicant talk about the 5.3 and that it, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's improved on the 4.1 to 2.4, which is, is the, uh, the requirement. Um, but I, I didn't see any sign or any, there's been no mention of any sort of paved area for uh, pedestrians. Now, these, these properties, you know, could well have families in, could well have children uh, living in these, and it's a very long, uh, unlit uh, roadway, which, yeah, if you've got children that uh, are going up and down, um, it, it, it would be, you know, in my view, particularly unsafe without any paved area or separation between the roadway and, uh, and, and, and the pavement. So there is a concern there, but obviously that's in the design of, of that. Um, and lastly, for me at this moment in time, is the, the question of the missing triangle, uh, which is a bit of a strange one, really. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder if the officer could inform us uh, of what the implications would be um, if that triangle was uh, actually part of this application, and also to clarify who owns that piece of uh, land as well. Okay, that's me now, thank you. I think there were two questions there, so I think Mr Faulkner's got the answer, I hope. Thank you, Chairman. Um, turning to the first point with regard to the, the issue of the fencing for, or in pertaining to the neighbouring property, as I said earlier in the presentation, um, clearly what we are recommending in this case is there is a planning condition with a requirement for that pedestrian visibility display to be delivered prior to occupation. That's a, a 1.5 by 1.5 display. Um, clearly we could potentially, with the applicant's agreement, bring that forward uh, to prior to commencement of development. So that is a possibility as an alternative if members are minded to do that. Um, I guess, though, um, obviously, if the applicant was to develop the houses and not uh, get that particular matter resolved, then they would clearly be in breach of that condition. So it would be rather bizarre and illogical for them to build the, the five houses and then find they couldn't actually occupy those dwellings. Uh, clearly, I would suspect they would want to resolve that at this stage uh, and uh, ensure that condition can be fully resolved um, turning to the other matters, uh, in terms of the width of the access road, um, well, that has obviously been subject to consultation with county highways. And in terms of the number of dwellings before us, the width of that is in excess of what would ordinarily be required for this uh, level of development. And similarly, in terms of the need for uh, a dedicated footpath leading into the scheme, I agree, it, it obviously is a lengthy uh, access road into the site but again in terms of highway standards there isn't a, an actual requirement to have a, a dedicated and separate access into this particular site for pedestrians particularly given the width so it can be a, a shared surface in that regard um, and in terms of the telegraph pole or well again um, with regard to actually being able to develop the site uh, given where that uh, that that lamp post or the, the telegraph pole is, I suspect that would have to be resolved relatively early on for them to actually even to be able to build this scheme. Um, so that, that obviously would have to be dealt with uh, accordingly. There isn't a condition proposed, but if members are minded to support the scheme, it is something we could add to, to the recommendation. Uh, in terms of the application itself, it's the site itself, 
As I said earlier in the presentation, yes, the uh, triangular piece of land in the uh, south uh, west corner of the site that was part of the original application um, and as part of that the site area would have been 0.55 of a hectare which in terms of the new national planning policy framework there is a requirement within there for major development sites and a major development site is any scheme of more than 10 dwellings or 0.5 of a hectare there is a need for affordable housing on the site um, in terms of the MPPF, the starting point is 10%, but clearly in terms of uh, this council, in terms of recent policy changes, we now have a requirement for 30% on the site. Um, so there is a trigger if the scheme was as first put in. Uh, that was obviously conveyed to the applicant and they took the decision to amend the application site boundary to actually take it below 0.5 of a hectare. Um, so the red line, I'll go back to the original plan. So the red line has been changed in that way, but the blue land, which actually denotes that that still falls within the same land ownership as it stands, um, was part of the original application, but it does still fall within the same land ownership. But clearly they are within their rights to change the application during the life of the application obviously moved the red line boundary to reduce the site area. But as it stands, as I understand it, that land still falls within the same land ownership. Right, I'm building up quite a list of speakers. Just one slight uh, thing, if you are minded to grant this application. Uh, we've heard reference from two people or three people tonight about the telegraph pole uh, it's actually a pole owned by the electricity company um, in what we call a joint user pole. So uh, BT uh, do share the pole, but it's owned by the electricity company. Right, now then, building up, uh, Councillor Bray. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think we, we've heard quite a lot of um, issues here. Um, Councillor Cawthorn, I think, brought forward a an important point that a, a similar case to this very close by um, was dismissed at appeal. Um, that's interesting in HG 13 QL 11. Um, I, my problem is with the triangle, shall we call it, in the corner. Um, I have an ongoing problem with triangles in corners and bits being nipped off the edge of um, planning application. It seems to be a bit of a common thing at the moment. And it's amazing that when a bit gets nipped off, it always seems to drop just below 0.5 hectare. I'm sure it's a coincidence. Um, and normally, there's very little we can do about that, uh, which is a little bit irritating because we need planning reasons if we're going to refuse an application, and that's as yet to be decided. Um, and, of course, this is backland development, uh, and it is outside of our envelope. Um, neither of those two things, of course, are enough, as has been pointed out to us many times, um, to refuse an application because of our situation regarding the five-year housing supply. But they nonetheless are reasons for refusal. There is, however, uh, something that concerns me here, because by chopping that triangle off, what you've effectively done is failed to really optimise the use of the land. And uh, here, the National Policy Planning Framework does give us some room. Um, and if we look at section 12, Achieving Well-Designed Places, uh, paragraph 127 of the National Policy Planning Framework, and I refer specifically to 127E, states that planning policies and decisions, decisions, sorry, wrong teeth, should ensure that developments, part E, optimise the potential of the site to accommodate and sustain an appropriate amount and mix of developments. Now, given that we know the whole of this site is in the same ownership, including the triangle in the corner, it clearly fails to do that. So this application, in my opinion, fails to comply with paragraph 127 of the National Policy Planning Framework. Now, if you add that to the fact that it is outside of our boundaries and that it is backland development, and I think that, added to everything that's already been said so far, um, gives us adequate reason for refusal. And whilst I don't want to stop debate or preempt a decision, um, I'm minded to propose refusal 
uh, with those as the reasons. I'd seek a seconder, but I think we should continue to debate as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Councillor McWilliams. Second. Well, Thank you, Chairman. A seconder, but, uh, fair enough. Can, I, can I just follow on from what yeah. Councillor Bray was talking about? Um, ju just basically, I mean, sitting here listening to it, and I've been jotting down a few notes, and from what I hear, I can, I can only see harm and no benefits in any of this. Um, there's no benefits be to the existing properties. They are going to be um, compromised with uh, traveling, traffic traveling up and down there, and as has already been mentioned, of the lights. There is no 106 payments or affordable housing anywhere. There is a mention of 12 thousand pounds but I cannot see how that does benefit in any way our district as a whole I mean that's where we're looking for with uh, affordable housing etc um, again there's no mix of development that's all there so several points have been raised and I'm, I'm inclined to actually second your proposal Councillor Bray and thank you chairman all right Councillor Alexander. Thank you, Chair. If we may go back to the foil that shows the, the driveway. Okay, we'll take it from there, that's fine, thank you. Um, th am I right in saying, one, that this is a shared driveway? And someone mentioned today that shared driveways over a certain meter, which I think was 18 meters, I, I'm not 100% sure about that. There must be one passing point on that. Could you confirm, because that was br brought up earlier to the officer, um, could you confirm that that is still, uh, that is in fact in place and I would like to return. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think the point in this case is that the, the width of the, the driveway would be 5 point or 5.3 metres throughout. Clearly, if it was narrower than that, um, there would be a requirement for a passing bay. There is obviously a suggestion within the recommendation from County Highways an informative be added to seek one. It's not suggesting a condition be imposed to actually require it, but um, given the width of the drive at 5.3, that in terms of the number of units actually being proposed here, that, that would still meet requirements. So we could certainly move from a recommendation, which is an informative, uh, to a recommendation that a condition be added to seek that uh, passing bay, but in terms of the width of the driveway, that is in accordance with uh, highway standards. I understand obviously that 18 metre element, but given the width of the drive, it does allow for, for, for at least cars to pass each other in terms of if a larger a removal vehicle or a refuse vehicle came down, then clearly there would be more of a problem of, in terms of conflict. Uh, but just looking at this layout, clearly what was proposed and approved to the south of the site was very much of a similar width, and that, that obviously serves uh, 10 dwellings, uh, obviously more than what we have before us today. There is some difference there, and clearly part of it does have pedestrian uh, footpaths on either side, but even there, it's only in part. Thank you very much. Um, sure, sure, I hadn't finished. Oh, sorry, I yeah, apologize. I'll give you I did ask for the right to return. Um, uh, if I may, please. Um, right, okay, so um, what I've gathered from that, we're satisfied uh, are we looking at this as a single track entrance or as a track for cars where two cars could successfully pass each other? And, and the right to return, I have one more point to raise. Thank you, Chairman. Well, yes, with a width of 5.3 metres, that would allow for cars to pass each other. Clearly, if there's a larger vehicles in terms of refuse or larger vehicles that come down then there would be an element of conflict but in terms of standards from county hall in terms of highways that that would allow for cars to pass each other yeah i want to switch this beast on 
That's fine. Um, we heard from, I believe it was one of the councillors who spoke and said the right hand, uh, the right, no, the left hand um, fence was in the private ownership and the owners had no intention of actually relinquishing any rights to that in any way, where the right hand one, there seemed to be some legal charge against that as we don't deal with governance um, on planning and um, that could easily be removed. So the reduction to the 5.4, presumably this is for people who are walking and getting pedestrian um, uh, exits and entrance. Um, what impact would that be if the fence on the left-hand side w was in fact over that, uh, th uh, that um, height? Um, uh, standard, I don't know, two meter fencing maybe or something, um, would the applicant then have to seek to have that removed down to 5.4 before this, um, the integrity of the application before it became uh, 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 to, to be fulfilled? Would the, is that not one of the conditions, original conditions of the planning according to the highways department at County? With regard, it, there's obviously a condition number three on the recommendation that prior to occupation there will be this requirement for this 1.5 by 1 point visibility display for pedestrians on either side of the, the access into the scheme. Sorry. Um, so it's in these positions here and, and likewise on, but principally on this side because that's clearly further forward there is obviously a little bit more space that you could accommodate that to, to the north. Um, but as it stands, um, before occupation of the dwellings, that clearly would have to be resolved. Um, it's quite prescriptive, that condition, that there, there is that requirement of 1.5 by 1.5, and there should be no obstruction above 900 uh, millimetres. So if that is not addressed, there, will, there would be a breach of that condition, and the dwellings couldn't be occupied. Right. Um, Councillor Colthorpe, um, and incidentally, you did get your seconding in, in ahead of Councillor McWilliams, according to my records, but now you have something in your own right. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a, an observation on um, uh, access to background sites. Um, safety policy HG 13, um, item 3, long or narrow driveways will be discouraged. Um, that carries forward in the emerging plan to uh, LP8 uh, item B. Long or narrow driveways will not be permitted. So it's just something I'd like the committee to uh, bear in mind. Thank you. All right. Now, before I go to the vote, as I say, I've got a proposer, I've got a seconder. Um, is there anybody else wishing to raise any other points or questions? No? Right. Well, the proposal is, and I'm going to ask the proposer to quote the two points that he, he raised earlier, is Councillor Bray. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Yes, I will do that. Um, the proposal is for refusal, and the uh, reasons for refusal will be uh, that it is in contravention of National Policy Planning Framework, uh, paragraph 127, part E, which requires that we optimise the potential of the site to accommodate and sustain an appropriate amount and mix of development. Um, clearly this application, um, by leaving that piece in the corner, does not optimise the land, that's quite clear. Um, and also, in addition to that, it is outside of settlement, which wouldn't be enough on its own, and it is back land development, also not enough on its own, but I think the three together should be more than sufficient. Um, that's the proposal. Thank you. Right. Councillor Colthorpe the seconder. Yes, um, I, um, I would like to um, add for reasons of refusal, um, HG 13, yep. which um, says um, HG 13 3, um, long and narrow driveways will be discouraged. Uh, that's, that's a saved uh, policy. Um, HG 13 uh, 5, it's out of character. I, I would still say that carries some weight. Um, QL 11, saved policy 2, uh, materially damaging the amenities of nearby properties. Um, emerging policy LP8, um, long and narrow driveways will not be permitted. 
an LP8 uh, emerging uh, F out of character and sets harmful precedents. But I'm open to the um, uh, proposer uh, and whether he feels any of those should be excluded. Um, thank you. Uh, Chairman, I'm happy with all of those subject to um, the uh, officer's comments. Right. Uh, yes, I'll give the officer just a chance to comment. Chairman, um, I'm not sure I really have much to add to that. The only point I would make in terms of looking at the issue of backland, um, which I accept in terms of the narrow and long length of the driveway, but obviously there needs to be an appreciation of what has been developed immediately to the south of the site in terms of an issue of character. So if you are looking at a character reason for refusal, um, I think clearly you would need to look at what's already been approved immediately to the south, particularly if you are considering it in terms of the character being a ribbon form of development on a road frontage. Clearly there has been development that has uh, already set a, a precedent to move away from that in terms of the land to the south. So if you, if you want to add that bit, I just would set some caution to that. But um, clearly, there is a difference when you look at the uh, vehicular access in terms of its narrowness between two dwellings. And mm -hmm. if members are of that view, that is what the, the yep. policy says. Yep. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm happy with that. Um, right. Okay. Yes. Um, so, can you clarify um, which of the reasons where are okay for us? Um, so we're we're using um, paragraph one two seven national policy planning framework. Presumably, that's okay. Correct. Um, HG13 is okay? Yes, as I said, um, yeah. just to be clear um, on that one, I is it just want to actually HG note once more right. which ones they are on yeah. there. Um, um, HG13, was it three? Thank you. Um, HD 13.3 is um, longer narrow driveways will be yeah. discouraged. Um, I think it's HD 13.2 is disturbance to neighbours. If the proposer wants to drop uh, out of character, and I'm happy to do that. Um, and then uh, LP 8. Uh, B is uh, long and narrow driveways will not be permitted. F is out of character. I'm happy to drop out both out of characters if you if you want to. Yeah, I'm happy with that yeah, as well. well, yeah, well I, yeah, that's I, fine. I'll take those away then. Thank I you. think there's more than sufficient without. So yeah. Right. Okay. Now you know what the proposal is on those various terms. Those in favour of refusal, please, with those terms. Please show. And those against? And one abstention, did I see? Right. Uh, that application is refused. It's only a legal officer missing, so we don't need one of those, do we? I think they can prove very helpful at times. <laughs> right, right uh, councillors, I think we'll make a start. Um, the second application in front of you tonight, uh, I have been asked, I'll tell you at this stage, this is a deferred item. And under our usual procedures, we do not take speakers on the deferred item. Um, however, there are three members of this committee that would have to leave the room if we got to debating it because they hadn't heard the applicant's um, talk last time. The applicant last time was the only person who spoke um, there was nothing from the parish 
all the ward councillors and therefore, um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, that's the ruling I've made and I hope you understand why when we get to it, we shall hear, get a repeat of what the applicant's agent said last time, purely for the three new members. Right, in that case, we're now turning to planning application number 1800767. This is an outline for land to the north of Sturview, close Missley. Um, and so I'll turn to Mr. Faulkner, is going to get this one as well. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as was said, this application was reported to committee on the 22nd of October and deferred to seek further clarification on the viability study that was submitted in support of the application. Um, previously, I went through the application, but I'll briefly go through it again tonight for those present. Um, the application before us tonight, I'll go to the site plan, um, is on the east side of Missley, um, going near to the Stow Estuary to the north. Um, existing residential development immediately to the south, um, which essentially comprises of uh, Stale View Close. Access into the site will be taken from Stale View Close uh, near to its access onto the, the main road, uh, which <coughs> runs through to the south of the site. Um, essentially a, a, an L-shaped site. Um, this uh, probably is more helpful, as I said, the, the Stow Estuary to the north of the site, uh, open fields to the, uh, the east of the site, uh, a part of uh, A and O and B. Um, clearly there is habitat uh, regulation in terms of uh, the river as well, in terms of what requirements there are there. This is slightly out of date, actually, in, in terms of the plan, as you're aware, uh, this site here is in the process of being built out by Hopkins Homes. Um, and most of that northern part is now actually developed uh, to the south of uh, the road there. Uh, again, as I said, looking at the site. Uh, these are various photos. Uh, this is the main road yep. and uh, the access going into uh, Stalview uh, Drive is, is just there, close. Um, in terms of the actual access to the site, um, this will be within this hedgerow here. Uh, within this area of uh, current grass amenity space. As you've come off of the main road of Stourview Avenue. Uh, various views across the site. You can obviously see the, the relatively Sylvian nature of the site. Um, various contours to it as well as you would have seen from your site visit today. Um, this is a, a view from existing Stourview close in terms of looking, I think you actually walked into the site from there today in terms of there is a link through, um, obviously uh, there is a, a, a public open space here in terms of children play facilities as well. Uh, another view across the site, looking northwest over the site. Um, this is views looking back towards uh, 16, 16 properties on Stale View Close. Again, well, obviously nearer and obviously further away. Um, this plan just shows the various contours across the site. Um, there's an existing stream that runs through the site. I think you can actually see on that uh, top topographical plan before you. Not very clear on this plan, but the site does steep. Uh, it's quite steep and it's actually quite contoured as well. Various, uh, this is the top topographical surveys, again showing the stream that runs through the site. Uh, another plan in terms of services, in terms of drainage. And in terms of the main, this is just purely for illustrative purposes at this stage, but uh, slightly confusing, but the blue area there is uh, the proposed area for the residential development. Um, a previous application, as suggested in, in the report, 1501810 for outline permission, uh, was approved by this committee, and ultimately the 
it was approved, well, went to committee <coughs> and with the section 106 was ultimately issued on the 30th of May 2017 and that was for 70 dwellings. So not significantly different in terms of what's before you today in terms of uh, what was on the previous scheme apart from the addition of uh, two additional dwellings. But in terms of gross densities, officers are comfortable in terms of the addition of just uh, two additional dwellings within this scheme well within um, does national guidance in terms of density <coughs> standards for the site. At the time of approval in 2017, there was a section 106 agreement attached to the consent and what was negotiated and agreed on that scheme was five dwellings to be gifted to the council as affordable housing. Uh, education contributions, um, which is <coughs> essentially dealt with by way of generators in terms of per pupil place. Um, but in total, at that time, it would deliver, taking on board primary school generator and secondary school generator, a sum of approximately 514,000. And on top of that, uh, following consultation response, there was a healthcare provision contribution requirement of 21,000, a habitat contribution of 3,000, provision and transfer of um, the public open space as part of this scheme, and in total, uh, that would generate circa around 538,000 of contributions. This application has come back. The, the applicant has looked post that decision at the cost of delivering this site. And as was explained at the previous committee, uh, significant costs are now being, uh, the applicants are suggesting having done their technical cost analysis, it's become apparent there are significant threats to the commercial viability of the scheme. Uh, this included, and it, it's stated on page 27 of the report, so I won't repeat them all here now, but various uh, issues with regard to the relatively long access road required to access the site uh, to accommodate this size of scheme. Um, there is a spring, as suggested earlier, that crosses the site. So they're, they're suggesting there's significant geotechnical design and construction work that will be needed for this development. Uh, they're also suggesting the route of the access road, which runs parallel to the stream. As I said, the stream runs through the site, basically in a north-south uh, configuration. They're saying that suggests there's some level of instability and that will have to be in investigated and addressed. Um, there's a need for modern in the stream to be undertaken to understand flows. Um, they're suggesting there's no straightforward locations in terms of attenuation given the, uh, the drop in the site. There is a suggestion there's a need for quite a substantial attenuation basin uh, within the, the northeastern area of the site uh, near to the railway. But in terms of how that is designed, within the site, that will be a significant cost to the application in terms of delivery. They also refer to the site levels on the site, um, and some parts of the site cannot be drained by gravity uh, to public sewer. Um, so there will be a need for a pumping solution to the scheme. And because of the levels and the complications of that, that will have to be by way of a deep chamber. There will be a need for retaining walls across the site, given the, the changing levels. Um, and due to the proximity to the railway line, um, there will be need for retained funds to underwrite any development costs uh, in relation to uh, reaching agreements with uh, uh, Network Rail. Um, as part of the application, the applicant submitted a viability appraisal, and that was subject to independent examination by um, a independent consultants. Uh, we used a company in London called BNP, oh, so it should be, yes, BNP, NB. in fact, it's actually wrong in the report, it's BNP, Paribus. Um, that was subject to some considerable negotiation between uh, the applicants' consultants and our independent consultants. And that ultimately led to a report from our independent consultants that the scheme with a profit margin mm -hmm. to the developer of 16.7%, uh, could deliver a contribution of only 260,000. 
um, and that would be made up of the requirements of the habitat regs to uh, meet the needs of uh, mitigation against uh, local habitats, being the, uh, the, the Stow River in terms of its conservation status from a habitat basis, and also the need to meet some of the costs of affordable housing, um, and that would be up to a sum of 250,000. But obviously what will be lost as part of that is the contributions both towards education and also towards uh, medical facilities in the area. So both those sums will be lost from the development. Um, what I'd also add, which actually states um, at 1.7 of the report, if this application was to be looked afresh in terms of the 70, 20, 72 unit scheme, things have moved on from the 2017 permission in terms of costs. Uh, county education have come back to say there is now a requirement to meet the needs of early years and childcare, uh, which adds a, another sum of money to the original sum of 113,000. Uh, and on top of that, both the primary and secondary contributions, because over time their, their matrix of contributions in terms of per place have also uh, arisen. So it's actually now gone to a potential sum of £777,000 for those particular elements. Uh, still the requirement for 21000 of health care, um, the requirements for the RAMS contribution, and... What we did seek previously was five gifted units. If we were now to apply the council's new position in terms of uh, the, the emerging local plan, we are now seeking 30% affordable housing on a site rather than potentially looking at gifted units as an approach. Um, so if we were looked to it afresh, we would actually potentially be seeking 30% affordable housing on this site as well. Uh, but as I said earlier, We've taken independent advice, which has been negotiated between our independent consultants and their consultants. And on balance, given to make the scheme viable, they believe that the scheme can only take a financial contribution of 260,000 based on a 16.7% uh, profit margin for the developer. Uh, in terms of national guidance and uh, the supporting uh, documents that actually go with that, I would refer you to I can find it myself. <laughs> yeah, one point eight of the report and essentially what government guidance is saying in terms of viability, in terms of benchmarking, they will allow for a assumed profit margin or what we call gross development value for a developer in the region or within the range of 15 at the lowest end up to 20% gross development value. Clearly the developer's uh, proposed profit margin is at the lower end of that at 16.7 but clearly it isn't as low as it could potentially go with uh, national guidance. We did go back to our independent consultants to ask them to run that assessment based on the 15% profit margin, and that would potentially lead to an uplift of the financial contribution to 544,000, which is essentially double what we actually have before us tonight. Um, that was something we did. We obviously have discussed that with the, the applicant, but as far as they are concerned, uh, what is before you tonight is what should be uh, determined tonight in terms of uh, that 16.7% profit margin and the 260,000 uh, profit to the developer. Uh, as I said, on, merit, on the planning merits, the case hinges on the 72 houses that will be delivered from this site, as was said previously on the last item. Uh, this council can't at the current time uh, meet the five-year housing land supply position. Um, if applied using the, the standard methodology, uh, this council clearly is of the view, given other appeal decisions, that there isn't a significant uh, uh, fall below that figure. And we are obviously in a position that we should still determine applications uh, accordingly and give uh, just limited weight to that at this stage. 
uh, and we obviously need to consider the application on its uh, planning merits. Uh, so really what does need to be weighed up tonight is um, the provision of housing in this case in terms of 72 housing, how that can help five-year housing land supply moving forward against clearly the loss of uh, the financial contributions, both in terms of education, uh, in terms of health care, and whilst there will be a 260,000 contribution, which in part will go towards Habitat Rex 8,000 and the rest towards affordable housing off-site, that is all that will be provided out of this scheme, and that was what members will need to grapple with tonight in terms of uh, the tilted balance and their view whether one uh, actually trumps the other, so to speak. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, now, as I explained earlier, I call on um, Mr. Stephen Rose, um, the uh, applicant. Good evening. Um, as agreed with the Chairman and your officers, this is basically a rerun of the content, content of the speech given by my colleague Will Vogt at the previous planning committee meeting. I couldn't unfortunately be there, and he cannot unfortunately be here this evening and sends his apologies. So, me speaking as him. Um, Chairman, members, officers, uh, you will have read the report and heard from your officers that the principle of development is already established by virtue of the outline consent granted in 2017 for 70 new homes. The site lies within the draft settlement boundary for Missley, where residential development is promoted. This is a material planning consideration of significant weight, which reinforces your office's recommendation for approval. At this point in time, the council has difficulty with an insufficient supply of housing. This situation places additional emphasis on the need for the council to get building and enable the delivery of much needed new homes. Since the 2017 permission was granted, technical reports have been prepared to tackle various engineering and technical matters. The site is sloping and includes springs and a stream. It is adjacent to a railway line and the main Anglia water sewer crosses the site. Significant engineering solutions are required to deal with these matters. These constraints do, however, bring some silver linings. Indeed, here, the constraints mean that over 30% of the site will be classed as public open space and will open up these areas in perpetuity to the public. This will bring sp specific and significant wildlife and landscape benefits. This will also bring two further new homes towards the Council's housing targets. Crucially, this scheme is viable. We pride ourselves on building high quality homes and doing a good job. We do wish to get on with the delivery of new homes on what will be a great site. I conclude by respectfully inviting you to approve this resubmitted application in accordance with your officer's recommendations and the findings of the Council's own independent expert chartered surveyors. This will crucially allow for the new homes to be delivered on a site already proven to be suitable for new homes. Um, and then to answer one of I think Councillor Alexander's question from this morning, if I may, um, the uh, Anglian, uh, sorry, the uh, Foul water pumping station, the proposal and plan is for that to be adopted by Anglian Water, who will look after the maintenance in perpetuity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Rose. Uh, just ask Mr Faulkner if he's got any further points that he wished to add. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the only point I would add, I neglected to say that in the, the, the presentation I should have done. Uh, this site, in terms of the adopted plan, doesn't fall within the settlement area, but in terms of the emerging local plan, and I think that's recognition that the site does have uh, an outline plan and permission for this scheme, has been included in the emerging uh, site site boundaries but clearly the point here is there is a scheme that could be it's an extant consent and could still be moved forward to the result of matter stage as submitted thank you for that right councillors your views um yes councillor alexander thank you chair and thanks to thank you to mr rose for um answering that question which as you know, I'd actually asked <clears throat> today at the site to visit. Um, 
One of the things that has come to my mind, and I would like to seek for um, uh, some answer to this, the actual stream that runs down uh, past the attenuation, where does it come out? Will it go out naturally into the flats of the River Stour? Is that where it comes through? How is it managed at its landfall? Um, oh, sorry. Can I, um, uh, the officer was searching for the final drawing, if I can refer you to the uh, drawing we have on page 25, um, which I think shows the spring going right down that hedge into a culvert at the bottom, which splits two ways and goes under the railway and then discharges into the river. If that's the way I think it is. Oh, I see that's right. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Chair. Um, what I'm trying to establish is what is on the other side of that railway, because we never saw that, on the, I'm able to see that on the site visit, is that the natural flat banks of the river, or is that further? F uh, the, the, uh, I mean, what, what's beyond that? What's beyond, where does it go? I haven't actually been that side of the railway line, to be fair, but uh, just looking at that uh, particular plan before us, I suspect by nature that water will, will run obviously into the estuary. May I, Please. May I come back, Chair? Thank you. Right, well, what I'm trying to establish, and I think we covered this, and unfortunately we didn't go into this in, in great depth. Um, Right now, on that slope, there is earth. And it's obviously quite sweet because water is going through it and the grass is green and healthy and there is no deterioration in the growth of the grass whatsoever. It's not patchy or show any signs of deterioration. What is bothering me, once we get um, uh, roads, etc., in, now I know that the developer is going to put in a series of filtrations of some sort. I didn't quite catch what that was in order that when it goes through the attenuation, there is some kind of purity. What bothers me with washing cars, etc., cetera, uh, slightly, and uh, I would like some clarification on that if you have the answer, is that if this is going straight into the river, that this water, uh, do we have that guarantee that that water will be acceptable for that river to take that as it actually is illegal to put pollutants into a river. Have I asked an impossible question? If I have, I'm, <laughs> I will resign and walk out. Thank you, Chairman. When answers to that, I would refer uh, uh, councillors to the Condition 11 on the recommendation, which sits on page 48. Um, so that does actually seek a formal scheme um, in terms of detailed surface water drainage scheme, uh, in terms of sustainable drainage. So there will be a need yeah. for full details to, to be verified and agreed as part of uh, obviously moving the scheme forward to, uh, to that, that condition will clearly need to be discharged. That's obviously something that's come out of uh, either the Environment Agency, I suspect it's come out of uh, our, our SOS teams at, at County Hall. There is a recommendation. There are discharge rates uh, built into that and various other elements in terms of storage uh, that would need to be verified. And there's lots of detail in there in terms of in infiltration tests, um, treatment for all the runoff leaving the site so there is mechanisms built into that condition to address that issue. Chair, I did read that in depth and understood it completely and it satisfies me now that um, people have heard openly that that will be, um, uh, 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 be seen because that was one of the issues that I picked up um, and somebody spoke to me about that some time ago what will happen to all the discharge water and its purity when it reaches that. And I thank you very much for your reply. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Fowler. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I am just referring back to the minutes of the last meeting 
which um, we, we resolved to defer this application to allow officers to gather further information relating to the viability assessment. And, and what, if memory serves me correctly, what we were actually asking for was the viability assessment itself to, to see that. And that, had, that had, had been uploaded to the TDC website, which uh, I would like to thank you for, because I certainly had a good read through. And I have to admit, there was some of it that did come across as somewhat confusing to me. There's no doubt about that. However, that was what I proposed and Councillor Alexander seconded. So at this moment in time, I'm quite satisfied with that. So I will be happy to support this application. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Any further questions? I'll, I'll start the ball rolling. I'll, um, the thing that worries me, I like the scheme. I make no bones about it, and I think it's very viral. I don't like the fact that we've got no housing, but what frightens me is the Essex education contribution. Um, 777,000, I think. Um, and so what am I asking the officer, we put it in the 106 requirements last time, what happens to the missing £777,000? If we are to approve it, um, then, then what happens? Uh, Essex Education make a statement in here which says something to the effect that should we refuse it, we want them to use, uh, to make sure that... Uh, uh, that, that it is there or otherwise. Page 36, I'm advised, I'm too far back. Um, yeah, that's the one. Um, so, uh, if the council is minded to turn down the application, it would be grateful if the lack of EYC, early years, primary, secondary education in the area to accommodate the proposed new homes can be noted as a reason for refusal. Yeah. In other words, they are not at all happy with that. And uh, so uh, there, there's other bits and pieces, isn't there? The uh, uh, health is another contribution and also the RAMS contribution. So we're really talking at about 800, 850,000 that's missing um, because it's got to be spent on the extra engineering works to get to the site. Um, and that worries me. It worries me no end um, as to what happens to that. And it's nearly a million pounds that we're short. Um, I don't know whether the officer can comment on that at all, but it's a statement that I've made that on my worries on the site. Right, Councillor Bray. Okay, first one. Okay, as long as you're all right with that. Um, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I echo some of the things that have been said. I think the, the developer is extremely brave, given what we've heard about the engineering challenges. It would probably be easier to build just off the pier, I think. Um, it's, it's a complicated one. Um, but the, the missing numbers do concern me, and it does seem to be a very substantial financial <coughs> shortfall. Now, given that we would not take money from a developer that wasn't required, if the money isn't coming from the developer, where is it coming from? So who will pick up the shortfall is the question that I would like to ask the officers first. Please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I guess I'll give a similar response to the one at the, the previous meeting that ultimately there is a requirement to meet the, the needs of the children from the development and that will fall with uh, the statutory requirements of Essex County Council to, to provide those spaces. And okay. the County Council clearly take an element of money out of council tax and ultimately that is where the monies will, will, will come from for that, yeah, that yeah, shortfall. So, so basically, in short, then, that shortfall would have to be made up by the council, and I'm very mindful of the fact that council's money actually is the money that belongs to our council taxpayers. It comes from their wallets and purses. So effectively, we are talking about um, roundabout way, our taxpayers putting in 
circa half a million pounds plus um, to underpin this development in order that the developer can make a profit of 17 point, or si sorry, 16.7%. Um, I find that more than a tad distasteful. I think um, overall though, our, our job here tonight, as I understand it, is to weigh benefit against harm. Um, so I've tried to do that and um, the way I see this, the benefit, we have uh, 72 new homes, um, which goes towards our five-year housing supply. But to put that into context, it actually equates to around about five weeks of our five-year housing supply. That is the benefit. Um, well, I've struggled. I really can't find any further benefits. The negatives are no affordable housing, so all of the properties would be at full price. Therefore, it's unlikely that local people would be able to benefit from the affordable housing they dare, so it's unlikely to benefit our local people that way. Um, and a substantially reduced amount of money going in, which means that in one way or another, our council taxpayers would be left with a substantial bill. So trying to do the benefit versus harm thing, which I think is what we're expected to do, um, I see substantially more harm than benefit here. And so um, whilst I, I like the development uh, in itself, I just don't, I agree with the developer, it isn't viable. And I think you have to reach a point where you say, no, it isn't viable, so let's not build it. And I think that's where we're at, personally. I just cannot see that the benefit outweighed harm. It seems the other way to me. Um, others may think differently. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. Um, can the officer um, answer why the developer didn't carry out a sufficient survey uh, at the time of the first application. And, and is there a requirement for the developer to do so? And I will come back. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have had a look at uh, what was submitted with the 2015 application. And there was a level of detail that was submitted in terms of uh, there was definitely a, a phase one death study and risk assessment carried out at that time and for members benefit what that did include was an assessment of the history of the site its geology the groundwater vulnerability hydrology of the <coughs> site, um, sources of contamination and as part of that, there was survey work done and in terms of where the stream across the site is, was identified as part of that, as were the levels of the site. So that was part of their reporting at the time. Uh, so they were aware of those issues. More work has obviously been done subsequently in terms of the new application. Um, they did put in a flood risk assessment as well, which would have identified the need for sustainable drainage across this site. They had various other reports in terms of ecology and arboric culture. Um, but clearly what the, the developer has done in this case has gone away and done more work and due diligence uh, following the consent and that has led to these particular issues. Uh, I can't obviously comment in terms of uh, how much risk and work they did at the application stage. That was their gift to put that in as part of the application. It was something we were happy to deal with on the basis of that information and at that time the applicant was uh, happy to accept the, the requirements in terms of the full section 106 contributions. Right, Councillor Harris, yes, come back. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I mean, I mean I'm not a, a builder or a developer but you know I've been on the site now twice and for me you know it, it was it was quite plain to see that there were special issues or circumstances on that site. I mean, number one, the site, it was clear to see that it had a very steep gradient um, and would re you know, possibly require certain engineering, um, particularly you know, in resolution of the pumping of the sewerage. Um, I think that that would have been you know, relatively easy for a developer to, to ascertain. Uh, and also that the access road would require specific engineering solution uh, particularly with regards to the uh, the stream or the spring um, that you know that you know that was clear to see. I mean, had it have been an underwater reservoir or something that nobody had seen or spotted, then I could have fully understood. But you know, I swear that I heard ducks quacking on it today. That it was clear to everybody that there was a stream there, um, and that uh, it should have been, you know, it should have been. Uh, 
looked at in a, in a special case prior to this. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've looked at this. I mean, is, there's no doubt that uh, the, the, the build, the, the quality of the housing, etc., cetera, has yep. got to be excellent. Um, and, you know, we, we, we're dealing with, a, a, you know, from what I've seen, a, a company that's very professional and uh, also uh, p produces a high quality product. Yep. But like Councillor Bray, you know, what, what I've got to do is, is to uh, look at the, the benefit versus the potential harm. And as Councillor Bray has already pointed out, you know, obviously the, the benefit is the you know, potential 72 houses uh, that will help with TDC's uh, target for, for housing. I mean, that, that's, that's clear. But then look at, weigh that up against the, uh, the harm. And, you know, I, I, I look at the harm as insufficient financial contributions towards infrastructure, insufficient contribution towards education needs, insufficient contribution towards healthcare, zero contribution or, or gifted uh, dwellings to the council. Uh, and and the, the emerging local plan requires a 30% affordable houses, which would have been 21 on, on this site. And this, this application, um, you know, sets out to remove this requirement, on, or, but there's going to be zero, as I understand it, um, affordable housing on this site. And, and it worries me that this could potentially set a, a precedent for future development uh, sites as well. Now, you know, I, I was elected here to represent the residents of this uh, authority, authority and, and, and district. Um, and with that in mind, you know, and, and has already been raised, who, who picks up the tab? Who picks up the tab for all of this capital expenditure that needs to be put in, in terms of health and education? And, and ultimately, it's going to be the taxpayer and the residents of this district. And for me, the, 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 the benefits do not outweigh the harm that this will actually uh, create. And... You know, I, it, it already has uh, approval for 70 houses and with, uh, you know, set uh, criteria and approval for section and, and, and payments for section 106, et cetera, et cetera. But we're, we're now being asked to, to move the goalposts. Well, for me, the harm doesn't outweigh, uh, sorry, that the harm outweighs the, the, uh, the, the benefits. And, and for that reason, I, I cannot support this application. And... I, I would like to move a motion to refuse this application. Seconded. Right. Um, Councillor uh, Bray has seconded it in my ear. I won't take a vote just yet in case anybody has anything else to add. Um, no. Well, um, I'm going to ask the officer before I take the vote. Um, Sorry, yes, I do beg your pardon before Sorry, we go Maurice any didn't further. See you. Yes, Councillor Alexander. Thank you, Chair. Sorry. No, it's <clears> my fault. Um, at the risk of being totally ostracised by one and all, I have to say that had it not been for these, this issue on education and the one of sex, I would have been very happy to have just seconded it to your proposal. Mm. And the reason being is that I believe that we must encourage our developers to come forward and we must give them every help that we can to maintain. There is two ways of maintaining um, our, our, our five-year requirement. One is through us ourselves in the way that we deliver our planning and planning permissions and for the developers themselves to match what we require in the final analysis. But we still have to look at this. And if you look at on page 34 under uh, uh, school services and then slide <coughs> over to page 35, <coughs> and it, <coughs> it goes to secondary education. Uh, the high school already has a full intake in September and, and anticipating a full intake uh, for years to come. Um, and again... Finance is the issue by which they talk. On page 36, 
um, having reviewed uh, approximately the site of the nearest primary and secondary schools, Essex County Council will not be seeking school transport contribution. But then um, we've just been told on the one page that there will be no school places because they're already full. And on this page, they're saying they're not seeking that because the nearest school is there, which, of course, will not feed it. In the view of this, then it goes on to say, if planning permission is granted, it would be subject to a section 106 agreement, and that thereby hangs the tail. <clears throat> because the Tendering District Council has, in the beginning of, of this application and on its approval, decided upon a 106 and the figure to match that. This was then challenged by an independent. It appears to me that why are we challenging, why are we challenging the decision of our own people? Are we making mistakes in putting the 106s together? in the beginning, or is it that the independent sees it from an entirely different point of view? Are we looking at a new way in the future of which developments will be, um, be seen? And are we opening the floodgates to everyone who wishes to come forward and say, right, um, this is the 106 that we wish you to pay and say, well, we go to an independent, which is their perfect right to do so. I think we need to tread very warily. I don't want to go against the application, but I'm not happy with it in this form. Had this been removed and not here, I would have backed it 100%. But because it is here, and we're dealing with education, our children, and the future, they matched everything else, and I think it's a great shame. I really, really do, because I would like to live on a hill overlooking such a pretty sight. <coughs> I think we'd all probably agree with you on yep. that. Um, just to remind you that the first outline permission, it's uh, the permission is shown there you're on page 55, which says that it is subject to the following matters being dealt with in the section 106, yes. education yep. contribution <coughs> yep. and the health contribution. Yep. And that really is the stumbling block and the lack of housing as yep. well. But yep. I, um, yep. I think those are the two stumbling blocks. But uh, I'm only speaking for myself. I, 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 as I said, I like the site. But uh, um, uh, yeah, I've just... <laughs> Come to us, Mr. Please. I just wanted to clarify um, a point that Councillor Alexander has picked up on, and that is that the original um, decision was based um, on the Section 106 contributions, and this is a new application whereby the um, developer has said, due to the reasons that have already been explained this <coughs> evening, um, they, the level of contributions in a section 106 would be different. Um, that was then assessed independently. So the independent assessment has not been to challenge the original permission in section 106. This is being treated as a separate application because it is different. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. So the, the independent assessment's not come in and said you shouldn't have granted that first permission in section one and entered into that section 106 it's diff it was a different application so I just wanted to make that slight distinction if that helps uh, yes That's yeah um, I, I really just to uh, agree with everything uh, councillor Alexander said I agree I think it's, it, it would be absolutely brilliant it's a lovely site it's a perfect place um, and the, the development itself I've got no issues with at all I just cannot <coughs> accept the idea that there's no affordable housing there and I cannot accept the idea that we effectively pass on a very substantial bill to our council taxpayers in order to do it I wish that wasn't the case um, but the engineering issues here mean that it is the case uh, and sometimes I think we just have to say really can't be done or really shouldn't be done. Shame no that is. I absolutely agree with everything you said, but um, we, we can't do that and expect our taxpayers to pick up the bill. 
it, it, it just isn't right. The harm, in my opinion, clearly outweighs the benefit, and, and that's the issue for me. Thanks. Yes, okay. okay. Yes. yes. I agree with everything that Councillor Bray has said, and to add to that, <clears throat> it is a huge shame at this stage just can't go away and rethink the whole thing again, and I know that's not possible. And to try and find somewhere in the middle where, which would work for everybody. And I'm sure that we will be looking at applications again, which we can agree to, and we will back 100%. Because I do believe in this application, but I can't put my name to the financial angle. Thank you very much. Um, well, before I take the vote, I'll turn to Mr Faulkner. No, it was just one small matter of detail in terms of the recommendation. Uh, there's obviously been a lot of talk tonight about uh, there won't be contributions towards the education and the healthcare, and that's clearly the case. Uh, but what is before us is an offer of 250000 and that would be money that would actually come to the council for affordable housing. So it's just a sum of money, but clearly there is something being offered, but it's not the gifted units on the site. And if we were to look at this afresh in terms of uh, the current application, we would now be seeking 30% affordable housing on the site, which is 21 units. Yes. Yes. Yes, Councillor Harris, um, as the proposer. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to, to read a policy out of the uh, Tenure of District Local Plan 2013 to 2033, um, which is uh, page 231 and 232, uh, which is the um, infrastructure delivery and impact mitigation. Um, and it says all, all new developments should be supported by and have good access to all necessary infrastructure. Um, such measures may include financial contributions towards new or expanded facilities and the maintenance thereof. Um, I just want to read this line out here, which is the, the important bit here. Uh, developers will be expected to contribute towards the delivery of relevant infrastructure. Um, and I, I just, at the end of the day, I just do not see the... Um, uh, the contributions uh, for this development to be sufficient uh, for the needs of the uh, local infrastructure and I, I do not see that uh, the burden should fall on the uh, tendering taxpayer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you all know now what the, the points that uh, you're looking towards refusal on. Um, no further questions or comments from anybody. Right, then I'm going to take the vote on this application being refused with the reasons that we've just specified. And I have it down as Councillor Harris is the proposer, Councillor Bray is the seconder. Right. Those in favour, then, please show on refusal. That is one, two, three, four, five. And those against? One against. And abstentions? I'm abstention on that one as well. So that application is refused. Thank you very much. That does bring us to the end of the business this evening. And, um